Thank you so much for the invitation, Sean, and I'm really glad to be here among friends and we, we've discussed these issues many times. I, I remember, for example, being with Tim Power, I don't know where he is, when, and, and Maruk, when the, the, um, the, the economist cover in 2009 uh, of, Brazil, of the Christ um, um, rocketing. And so Brazil is on the rise. And I would like to start with what Madeleine has just asked Sean about the perspective of growth and how, how does that um, um, affect the possibility of seeing Brazil on the, on the rise. And, and, and so I, 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 I feel glad also to come right after Sean because it's always nice to come after someone tells good things about your country. And especially in the presence of the ambassador, when I have to say um, a few things that are very skeptical. Um, so, <laughs> I'm uh, not so optimistic. And I, I, th I think that my, my basic message, or my, my two basic messages, would, would be, one, we are spreading too thin. Um, I'll try to bring a few um, points here to, to strengthen what I've just said. And, and, and so we are covering too many issues. Um, and second, uh, and more uh, in, 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 in uh, related to the, to the integration of South America, it seems to me that we have to be very cautious to regard the Brazilian development model as something that really offers a way, uh, an alternative and efficient and effective way to do economic integration uh, in, um, separate from economic liberalism. So uh, an alternative way to economic liberalism to do economic integration. Um, and these are, these are my basic points in all my discussions with Sean throughout these happy moments here at ANU since I came. And, and, and it doesn't mean that Brazil, in my view, doesn't offer opportunities for investment. It doesn't mean that Brazil will not grow. It doesn't mean that um, companies can't profit out of integration, integrating with Brazil. It doesn't mean that there aren't opportunities out there and that lots of people, in the end of the day, in the end of the year, years, will uh, have a good feeling about their decision to grow more interconnected with what's going on in Brazil. Um, still not enough as a good point to start my criticism. So I, sh I should bring some more good things about Brazil. <laughs> um, there are very important changes in Brazil's, let's say, development model in the recent 15 years. For one, we've controlled hyperinflation. We still don't really know how we, you were, we, most of the political discussions are not uh, taking advantage of the fact that, that there is information out there of how Brazil has controlled hyperinflation. We don't teach other countries not to do what we did in, in, the, last, in the previous 50 years that caused inflation to grow so significantly up to 2,600% a year. We are not telling that story, and we are not telling that story to our Mercosur partners and to our um, UNASUR or CELAC par partners. And in, in saying that, I'm especially referring to Argentina, but not only. We, we don't advance the message of what, what happened in Brazil that really created this momentum for growth, for exports, um, another big change ha has to do with, uh, you know, social policies and the way we addressed social policies in the previous 15 years. And this has to do with doing very basic things. If there are people that need more money, let's tackle them first with scarce public money, especially in social policy, in the social policy budget. Um, when we're talking, you know, when, when talking about social policy in Brazil, we basically uh, think about the Bolsa Familia program. 
And when someone like me will criticize Brazil, the first question I get is, but are you against the Bolsa Familia program? And so just let me say very clear, I'm completely in favor of it. What I resent is that we are not concentrating more in doing good things like that. And we have to, we have to spread the word. You can't do everything you wanted to do. And there are things that have better social results than others. So you have to choose. It's a, it's a very difficult choice. And even if we, as we are telling the world what we've done well, so Bolsa Familia, um, a conditional cash transfer program, we are still not saying do not spend scarce resources in doing all the kinds of social programs that don't work. They are too costly and they are targeted towards uh, the richest. And we, have, we are a champion of doing that in the world. You know, up to now, more than 80% of Brazilian social budget at the federal level goes to the highest paid, uh, the, the highest income families. Starting with free university system for 30% of university students. At, the, at, at universities that have very high, very difficult entr entrance exams. So the, the, the poor cannot reach that. Costs $10,000 a year at the very least. Some ex estimates put, put the cost at $18,000 a year per student. So it's the opposite of Bolsa Familia. Yeah, and we are still not wanting to learn that lesson. So when we are talking about Bolsa Familia, it's, it's, it's less than $1,000 a year per family, up to three kids. So the most you get is if you have three kids, they're all at school, and you get much less than $1,000 per year. University students at free federal universities get not the cash, and it's not conditional to grades, but they get $18,000 per head or is spent so that each one of them can be there. So, so this, this is, this, th these are the good points. I mean, we did changes. They are very significant. And we engaged in very strong market-oriented reforms in the 1990s. They were, they were strong, but they were partial. And when we look into the rates of growth for the Brazilian economy in the previous in the, in, the, in the previous decade. We can see that we had some good years, very good years, exports more than doubled. Um, and, but it's, uh, but it, it, we, we, it, that can't go further without more reforms. And, and when Madeleine brought the, the question about privatizing airports, that's part of the lessons that, the, the lesson that we've we, we got through, we, we, we understood, but it took us 10 years of left-wing government for them to start doing it again. And we don't need only five airports, we need much more of them. And Maruk's story about ports is even more telling. But the problem has been there for, I don't know, 60 years? <laughs> and it's, it's, it's not, it's, it's not counterintuitive that you get less workers and the productivity goes up. So that, that's the story. Um, let me... Um, uh, say on, on, on which grounds do, do we expect... Oh, oh it's here. Um, well, on which grounds Brazil, Brazil bases its idea of uh, integrating more with South America. So, will you tell me when I have yeah. ten minutes, five minutes? Um, so, traditional traditional values in the Brazilian foreign policy: um, peace, international law, sovereignty, diplomatic setting of disputes, multilateralism. Sean touched in most of these points, and they're very attractive. 
and they, 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 they are in, embedded in Brazilian history and in the tradition of Brazilian foreign policy. They, they are a contrast, very significant contrast, with all the uh, concurrent or competing um, um, ideas of uh, values and principles in foreign policies in the region, especially is a contrast with the United States policy. Something that is not written as a value, and again, a strong contrast with the United States. It's a distrust of, the, of liberalism as a moral guiding principle in all its dimensions, except multilateralism, cooperation, but it's a distrust of liberalism as a base, as in, 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 in its economic dimension. It's a distrust of freer markets, more integrated markets, of market mechanisms at the domestic level. And this is not the Brazilian foreign policy only. It's the Brazilian mindset in general. And that's part of our reluctance in understanding what happened in Brazil in, in the fight against hyperinflation. That we, got, we got prices right. We got better uh, incentives for prices to be uh, in accordance with world markets. Makes a hell lot of a difference in costs. Uh, we are also distrustful of um, less so, but still, of the political dimension of liberalism, both at the domestic level and at the international level. Um, for, the, for, the, for this political dimension, I'm talking about re representative democracy. And it's less a distrust now than it was before, because now we accept some questioning of other countries' crisis or the way they manage the crisis, and we can see Brazil's action in, in the Paraguayan case of a few weeks ago. Um, but we still will say that Venezuela is a champion of democracy. And they are alternative democratic regimes, alternative ways to handle um, uh, governments accountable. We'll say that, you know, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa tells an important story about democracy. Gabon, for example. So we are playing with the value and the principle of liberalism. Um, uh, other than the principles of Brazilian foreign policy, Brazil strongly believes that globalization has, um, has its downsides. And this is part of the disbelief that I mentioned about economic integration and economic liberalism. And it will, will put us in a situation that is very weird, that we are trying to build more economic integration or more liberalism, but we are not a liberal force ourselves. Very different from the scenario that we saw at the second half of the, of the 20th century. But not only the United States had a, a rhetoric for the integration of, 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 of the Western countries via trade uh, liberalization, but it offered its own domestic markets for grabs for in negotiations. So it's, it's, a, it's a belief in the importance of unilateral trade liberalization first of all, and then, as would be hard to sell for the domestic constituency, to engage in trade negotiations knowing that you benefit from trade when you import, not only, or not mostly when you export. And our debate about trade is strongly influenced by a mercantilist view. And I, I, I would like to quote our our former foreign minister, Celso Amorim, who already came to this conference through the voice of Sean. And in a recent article, 2010, 
in which he was talking about the, the legacy of foreign policy by President Lula. He said, foreign policy is an important instrument for promoting development. The robust trade surpluses sustained over the last few years can be, at least in part, attributed to the opening of new markets. And now comes the interesting part. Although Brazilian foreign policy objectives cannot be reduced to a mercantilist view, although it cannot be reduced, this is true. He's, he's, he's saying there is a mercantilist view of the world, an active diplomacy not limited by outdated precon preconceptions helped to boost Brazilian businesses all over the world. So we still have a very mercantilist view of trade policy. Your, your, it, trade policy works, or trade integration works, when you have trade surpluses. That's very bad for economic integration in the longer term. It's also very bad when you disconsider the fact that economic integration involves the government setting a framework for businesses and individuals to make decisions uh, that will, can only be harvested, the profits can only be ha are harvested in the future. So prices or expectations about variations in prices are very important. And when we say, as he says in the same article, that the Mercosur will be strengthened by the, uh, 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 by the entrance of Venezuela, an economy that not only has price controls, but has nationalizations of private businesses. It makes me feel very uh, uh, strongly uh, uh, about these, uh, these, these stress on market policies. Great, thank you. Um, so globalization has downsides. Power is being diluted. Um, Brazil's rise together with the rise of other emerging economies, uh, represents a, a strength of multilateralism in world politics, a strengthening. Um, multilateral organizations should be more democratic. And the use of democracy against is problematic. Because Brazil benefits, or has benefited somewhat, from the non-democratic -democ aspect of some of those institutions being called forth to share the decision with a few other countries has strongly emphasized Brazil's differences and Brazil's power, capacity to influence decisions. So I'm not sure, and I don't know if officials are sure, if democracy here means one country will vote, as in the OAS, is that what we want for the IMF or the, or the WTO? which has a weird system in itself by consensual vote, consensual vote. Um, or we want to be among the few. We like the G20. The G20 is not the G200. Um, Brazil's image has changed for the better. Um, control of inflation, starting new social policies with very good results, as I've mentioned. And, and of course, Brazil is willing to play a greater role. We've seen Brazil trying to um, be at, on the table, at the table, in discussions about nuclear prol proliferation, the Middle East um, and crisis, and more recently in the region, Honduras and Paraguay just to mention, to mention a few. Um, I, I'll just go very, very quickly here because Sean did a great job in, in, in coming up, but I, I, as, as he, he came with the Canadian version of what CELAC means, <laughs> OAS minus two plus one, um, um, I'll, I'll just bring, uh, just bring, bring it back, and in my sense that this is 
a, 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 it could be a positive counterbalancing of US hegemony, hegemonic interests and principles. But we have to be aware of what we are talking about, especially when, in the, uh, when, when we discuss strategies of, in, uh, of, of intervention and strategy of cooperation and in, interdependence, integration in the region. But, but I, w with this idea here, I I'd like to stress my, my first point, that Brazil is, Brazil's strategy is having a result of we are spreading ourselves too thin in global affairs. We of course have some delusions of largesse. Um, we think that we are a power, uh, we are soft power, and it's, it's interesting, when Brazilian students of foreign relations talk about soft power, they usually emphasize soft. They don't emphasize power. It's still power, but it's the attempt is to say that we are non-indifferent, that we care. We are doing more humanitarian assistance. Uh, we are fighting, um, we are more solidaric. We are fight, fighting hunger, fighting poverty, fighting, even if with very limited resources. Um, we are spending money with the less developed countries in our region. We have a, if, if, again, if, even if under under financed, we have these four same mechanisms, the mechanisms for, for structure, structural convergence inside Mercosur. And it's great, we're building houses and for poor people in Paraguay with this money. But it's a very limited, so Brazil says, our integration strategy is different from NAFTA, market-based, and, and what was supposed to be Mercosur in the first place. Well, at least in the second place, when, when it started to be actually negotiated and implemented. In the first place, when it was designed, it was thought like a common market in five years. And then, the, and then negotiators became more aware that you can't do the job. Um, and we are doing cooperation among equals. And my, that, that's my, the point for my second question. Do, do we offer the resources? And more importantly, do we offer a alternative but equally functioning strategy model of economic development through integration? And my response is not. Um, just, 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 just as a, as a quick image of, of, of our, our, our one of the, our delusions of, of greatness or largest. This is the number of embassies of all the, the top countries in number of embassies. And I've, I've, I've put some two tentative accounts of the costs. So um, you can't have more than, I don't know, 205 embassies, right? But, um, so the, the, the two columns to, to the right, uh, they, they will show you um, um, tentative accounts of what's the cost. And they, I, I take this from the world development indicators, except for the Cuba date. And, the, and the, 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 the trick here is, uh, the lower the number that you have, um, the higher the cost. Okay. And so, it's not the worst scenario, but it's still a very cost strategy to put one embassy in every country that you can. And now Brazil is the only, the, the second country in the Americas that has 34 embassies, one embassy for each one of the independent nations. Um, just a quick joke about, about our model and quick references to the life of Brian. And this is an interesting point, uh, the Mon Python film, in which they are trying to organize a plot uh, against the Romans. And the, ba the basic question is, what have the Romans ever done to us? And the answer is supposed to be is no, nothing except for sanitation, education, the aqueduct, wine, security, and, and, then, and the list goes on. Uh, free trade and trade integration through market means has brought many good things to Brazil. 
and many good things for other countries that have joined. But we still discuss that there, there should be other more solidari solidaristic ways of integration. We should have more Cuban doctors and not so much exports for, of sugar. Or and so my, my basic point, and I'll finish, I, I'm quickly finish, finishing, is you know, our model involves, and it, it is clear in the Brazilian development programs in countries such as Peru, Bolivia, uh, Venezuela, and, and that, that you can, it, we will discuss, involves picking winners, mostly Brazilian companies, subsidizing through credit. I couldn't say better than Sean about Benet Diaz. And protectionism. It brings lots of administrative management of prices, of bids, of licenses. It doesn't create the dynamic of innovation, increased productivity, so on and so forth. And we have, and this is a final point, um, a situation of declining financial capacity for foreign direct investment. It's not huge, but it's still it's declining. Thank you. Now, I think that Sean actually mentioned the management of Chavez, and I think that this is an important political dimension of relationships with Venezuela. And for sure, I, I completely agree with what he was saying. Brazil is called for, for Brazil plays a role in moderating what, what, uh, 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 the, the damage that, that, that Chavez's populism could bring to um, the, the not, not the image, but uh, uh, the important decisions made by, 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 by uh, organizations such as UNASUR. Um, my point with the integration of Venezuela is that you can have, you know, first, free trade areas are not free trade. And Mercosur is not even a free trade area in, anymore, but it's even try to, tries to be more, tries to be a customs union in which you have the same structure for protection against non-member countries of, the, of, of your organization, of, of the area. Um, it's, it's supposed to be a, a free trade area plus a foreign, uh, foreign defense mechanism, tariff structure, uh, customs uh, procedures, and, and so on. Uh, but uh, the Venezuelan economy is, is less and less a market economy, less and less so. It makes it really difficult to uh, engage businesses into long-term planning for uh, integration, even, even if through trade only. But if we were talking about uh, supply chains and we we're talking about opening um, joint ventures and, and so on, it becomes more uncertain, not less. Um, um, the point is not that you don't use your diplomacy. Um, the point is whether it is a value in itself, trade surpluses. Um, um, trade surpluses is, is not better than trade deficits. Trade surpluses means that you are not consuming all you can, but you are actually saving in foreign currency. Um, it can have political consequences. Um, it's, very, uh, it's very difficult to know whether it's better to have a trade surplus or uh, um, sustainable foreign direct investment in, in your economy. So we, we had the two. We had situations in which trade deficits were financed by long-term foreign direct investments. Um, and it, it also promoted economic growth. Whether that was, um, uh, wh whether that model was sustainable or, or not is open to debate. Uh, and many countries have trade deficits as this, at the same time that they have strong economic growth and long-term economic growth, and not only the hegemon, which had, but not only it. Uh, whether the foreign policy is used to promote it is also <coughs> brings me the discussion of the principles and values. Um, is that an interest in itself? And can it be part of, a, of an engine for economic integration among, among neighbors? Because you know, if you're doing a Chinese strategy of building trade surpluses, uh, someone is going to have to have trade deficits. 
And if it's a structural problem, a solution here, it's a structural problem there. The, the balance of payments of the world is zero, as we know. So it's structural trade surpluses bring structural trade deficits. Um, um, so uh, you don't necessarily need to be a mercantilist. And if you are, it's going to be difficult to engage in trade uh, uh, in integration and integrations of all the sorts. That, that's my, my only point. The comparison with the United States, United States is not to say that the United States was still, um, uh, still engaged in multilateral trade liberalization, even less so to say that it was engaged in unilateral trade liberalization. Because, as you said, they are not since the 80s. But the fact, and, but the fact that they are not has, has a lot to do with economic difficulties, not economic prowess. And the more complex political game in Washington, then with a change in, politic, uh, in the values and principles that, that sustained unilateral and multilateral trade liberalization. Um, the, the US and Great Britain did uh, abide by the Most Favored Nation Clause before World War II. The, in fact, the UK did it in the 19th century. And other countries that were not hegemons uh, abided by it um, also after, after, after World War II. So it's, um, it, it's it, my, my point here is not to say that we are necessarily wrong. I, mean, I think we are wrong. I think we, we benefited a lot, Brazil benefited a lot from importing substantially. That's one of the ways that we fought hyperinflation in the 1990s. It, it could have been sustained. Um, but what I'm saying is that we don't have inside our, in, and not only foreign policy officials, but inside the, uh, the mindset of the country in general. Now it's everywhere, and it has, had, had been before the 90s. We don't have an acceptance of the principle that uh, that you should open more. And we are just doing the opposite. Last week we increased protection in 100 items at the same time that the rhetoric is more integration. Coming to a point where the finance minister said if that has a negative impa impact on prices then we will revise the decision. Well, if you're increasing protection, how come it's not going to have a negative impact on prices? Isn't that the goal to have a negative impact on prices. And that's part of the confusion about. And I, so I'm referring more substantially about the, the ideological struggle that is not there in the case of Brazil. And it has been in the United States case and in other countries. Well, Argentina had liberals, economic liberals in the turning of the 19th to the 20th century. And you can say that they became poorer as a result of going there. And you had other countries who also engaged in unilateral free of trade liberalization, Brazil being one of them. We did unilateral trade liberalization in the 90s when the Uruguay round was open. So we, that my point is to understand the political conundrum that in that case pr promoted more integration and that was behind the success of, of Mercosur. And now it stalls it. But we don't, we don't assume that this is a problem. So we don't take the actions that are actually making it more compatible with integration. Okay, so, so this is, this is what important. And then in, in terms of, of your point, it's, 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 the, first, it's the first. So uh, Brazilian investments, so Brazil, investments that are financed by the Brazilian National Development Bank in all the neighboring nations do not involve uh, the moving of workers to other countries. And that is a clear contrast with China, as you mentioned. And it, it might, it, it certainly makes, uh, it brings uh, uh, pros and cons. But for so, in, in social terms, it's more acceptable, the Brazilian strategy. It, it creates less negative reactions among uh, you know, ordinary citizens and, ordi and, and, and businesses that have nothing to do directly with the, with, with the projects. Um, it also has cons. 
Um, Chinese migrants bring entrepreneurship, bring capital, bring some other things, bring work ethics, and and, and so they when when they integrate with these uh, societies at the very local level, they also promote they they can promote uh, good results, a change, a, a shaking of the economic and social environment, which is, which is positive. Yeah, I, I think that. Thank you. It's it's well. It has Brazil now has close to universal primary education, rates of attendance and around ninety eight percent. And it's a new. It's it's a fifteen year. Um, uh, it's a result that has been achieved in the nineties and has has been carried on. Uh, uh, but we still don't have universal uh, uh, high school attempt. Now the coverage is. Conservative, a very conservative figure. Sixty percent of, of 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 the youth go finish high school, mostly girls. Uh, but the more updated figures, they they are around fifty percent. So the number of years at schooling of Brazilian workers hasn't increased enough. And when compared to other countries, that 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 have uh, lower GDP per capita, lower levels of, of IGH. Brazil, the figure is even worse because we haven't progressed as other countries have. Uh, if you look into qualitative indicators of the uh, of the of the uh, primary and secondary education, we, we we also rank very poorly among the the least in the PISA uh, indicator, for example. And that the energy hasn't been there to to do what other countries did in order to change that. One one important thing that has to do with the quality. Of primary education is the is the system of um, uh, I can't I don't have the word in English but how how you uh, teach students uh, to read you, you, two basic alternative systems um, one is uh, is it's based on phonetics it's the one that you have here um, and and the one the, the other one is is the the more more than 20th century or politically correct. That's what Brazil adopts. Um, in itself, one is not better than the other. Finland, for example, uses the same system that Brazil does. It's on top of PISA. Um, but it's, it, it is biased. The results are biased by uh, levels of socioeconomic um, um, standards. So when you have a minimum level, income level or level of cognitive development, any system will do. But under that level, phonetics is much better, and we we aren't in, and that, that's for global comparisons. Uh, there are interesting studies in the U.S. comparing uh, states or cities that have changed the system, and the results that are that for, for for to be grabbed. But we we haven't seen the energy to to change that, and and the expansion of high school has been very low. And when we divide, we, we split the educational budget on, on, on all levels of, of administration with, with a, a, a stronger per capita expenditure on tertiary education than we do on secondary and primary. Sorry. Thank you, Carl. Thank you.